This is Jim Fetzer, your host on The Real Deal, with my very special guest today, Greg Hallett. He's attained acclaim for his muckraking journalism, for his revisionist history. He's an expert on World War II, and he's done a series, a five-volume study, on the legacy of the monarchy of the kings and queens of England. He's a remarkable guy, and I'm very pleased to have him back on the real deal in our new video format. Greg, welcome to the show. Thank you, Jim. It's uh, great to be back. Um, the last show we did was January 2015, and a lot has happened since then. I've had a claim for the status of Prince Pretender to the crown, uh, throne and crown of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, which is valid from the 1st of March 2015, 3 p.m., and um, that is largely an agreement and I've been looking for ways to get it recognized on paper and I've had a great deal of um, stubborn non-action from the British courts and there has been a whole lot of shenanigans going on in the courts to the extent that in June, July 2015, lawyers in England were protesting outside the Royal Courts of Justice in London based on that there was no longer any avenue for law or any avenue to argue a case. And it appears that when I lodged my case to be recognised as Prince Pretender to the throne and crown of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, that actions were taken by the courts to act in the following way. If we like you, we'll do this with the law. If we don't like you, we'll do this with the law. And once you go down any of those paths from the first decision, there is no way of getting back to the start position unless you go to, unless you spend a quarter of a million pounds and go to the Court of Appeal. Now, in doing that, the judges have um, been ignoring the law. The judges have been ignoring the civil procedure rules and ignoring the uh, practice management rules. As such, they've been acting with bias and they've been acting also without subject matter jurisdiction. Because my case outlines quite clearly that the entity known as Queen Elizabeth II is illegitimate. And there seems to be widely held recognition that the entity called Queen Elizabeth II is in fact illegitimate, has never been properly crowned, and is in fact a commoner. And even um, a Prime Minister in 1997 uh, said um, that Queen Elizabeth II is now just a commoner. So, because the judges have sworn an oath to Queen Elizabeth II, and she is illegitimate, there is um, a real problem getting justice, and on top of that, there is um, uh, Prince Philip is a... DVD agent. He is uh, Deutsche Wörterkunstdienst, which is um, for them the war never ended. He's a German Nazi, and to be a Nazi, and his, his three sisters married Nazis, to be a Nazi you had to be a Catholic. So the Catholic Prince Philip has married the Anglican Queen Elizabeth II, or Princess Elizabeth, and then Queen Elizabeth II. And she was not allowed to marry a Catholic. Which makes her marriage null and void. So what I did was deliver a letter to 10 Downing Street um, claiming the throne. And it was a superior claim to the throne. And David Cameron passed it to Queen Elizabeth II who absolutely recognised that it was a superior claim to the throne. And then went about instructing Prince William to select amongst his three girlfriends, then get engaged to one, and then Ladbrokes had betting on that from two months later, from early October 
2010, and then they got engaged, and then they got married, and then they had children. Now, what the fake royal family does, the flat lie royal family does, is births, deaths, and marriages, and engagements. That's all they do. They can't contribute to uh, England because they're compromised through their illegitimacy. And, um, uh, right, yes, so what's happened is the, um, the judges are in a peculiar situation where the courts of England have been taken over by the European Union who are working for the Nazis. Um, and it's well, it's well known that the European Union is Nazi and the United Nations is Soviet Socialist. So what Queen Elizabeth II did from 1973 is continually abdicate her position. And that included signing the European treaties which gave, originally it was joining the um, European common market, but the rule, the, the names were changed and the rules were changed and there were 10 treaties ending in the Lisbon Treaty in 2008. And what it effectively did was give the controlling elements of the United Kingdom to Europe. And that included the judiciary. Now, Queen Elizabeth II was, is well aware of the predictions that she would... Um, uh, that, that there would be the truer monarchs who would claim the throne um, during the Shin years, which is the 21 years, 2010 to 2019. So what she's gone about and done through her husband, Prince Philip, who's a Catholic Nazi and extorts Elizabeth on the basis that she's illegitimate, um, what they've done is bankrupt the United Kingdom and transfer all the assets, all the invisibles, and the physical ownership and the money to the EU, which is Nazi, and try and leave the United Kingdom by the end of her reign as an entity without any value whatsoever, which is um, a really bitchy thing to do. And the judges, her judges, are also doing whatever they can to not hear the case that the entity called Queen Elizabeth II is illegitimate, that her father is not a father, her mother is not a mother, she was conceived by artificial insemination, she was born above a pub, and the BBC was started in the same year that she was born. Now, the BBC is known by the SAS as Bullshit House. And now it is known by half the population as Bullshit House. So the BBC has been working since Princess Elizabeth was born to promote her as the Queen, knowing very well that she is an illegitimate commoner. The um, monarch of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and, and Northern Ireland is acclaimed. They're not crowned, they're acclaimed. That's what makes them the monarch. They're acclaimed the monarch. So all you need to do to take over the monarchy is control the press. So in order to acclaim Princess Elizabeth as Queen Elizabeth II, the BBC was started as soon as she was born and went about presenting her as a legitimate entity. When she wasn't. And the military controls the media. So the military can have as many wars emanating from England in the square mile of London, as many wars as it likes. Because the military controls the media and it's the, the BBC and PATH, P-A-T-H-E, which did the old movies that show 
that reveal, that show that Elizabeth is the queen, when they know damn well that she's not, and they've presented, they've they've prevented all other claimants from having, from being heard, and therefore being acclaimed. So, um, what I've been working on, one of the things I've been working on is a chart which shows um, that Queen Elizabeth II has been illegitimate for many generations. And I've been counting up the times from Queen Victoria to the present that there's been an illegitimacy. And it is about 20. 1, 2, 9, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24 illegitimacies in the main trunk, including some siblings, of the British royal family from 1818 to the present. So they've been creating a purposeful, illegitimate royal family um, for the 200 years from 1812 to 2012, which is the Shin, or Forbidden Secret. And the Shin was started in 1815, 18, no, it started in 1812, by Mayor Amsterdam Rothschild. And it was through the Battle of Waterloo um, and the commodity bursts and the British royal family losing their money um, betting on the wrong side, that the Rothschilds um, bankrupted the British royal family and then took over the breeding rights of the British royal family. But they were only allowed to do that in the Shin, or Forbidden Secret, for 200 years, which is from the um, 19th September 2000, uh, 19th September 1812 to 19th September 2012, and then this whole thing is supposed to be resolved before the end of 2019. Um, so Queen Victoria was the first person born in, these, in the Shin, the first royal born in the Shin, and she was half Rothschild. Her father was Baron Jacob made a Rothschild of Paris. And she found out the secret, so she had a secret firstborn son. She married the second in line to the throne, blind Prince George of Cumberland, and had a, ch had a child with him. And he was, um, uh, he was born in Carlisle Castle and then taken to um, Kensington Palace in London, and he was raised in the tower there for about three months. And then he was shipped to Portugal. When he turned 16 in 1850, Queen Elizabeth II, uh, sorry, Queen Victoria sent him a chest full of royal marks to show that he was the King of England. And you only need three royal marks to show that you were the King of England, and we have a chest full, and in these books here, ah, uh, the Hidden King of England, um, we have presented, there's actually five volumes, there's only four in there at the moment, um, Here's the fifth one here. Da, 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 da. Um, in, in, this, in these five volumes, we've presented never-before-seen before photos of 40 royal marks. And there's only three required to become the monarch. Um, now, it's an extraordinary story, and during this time, some extraordinary things happen. And some of those things that happened are quite contrary to what you would consider to be rational. So, um, uh, some of the irrational things that have happened has been the change to the laws of succession and the change to the laws regarding denouncing the British royal family. So... First of all, I uh, delivered the letter to 10 Downing Street in 2010, 
And then Queen Elizabeth II, uh, so Queen Elizabeth II, wrote the laws of succession and strangely used New Zealand lawyers to do it. And I'm from New Zealand. And then um, it was backdated to the 25th of April 2013, which is the 179th anniversary of the birth of Prince Marcos Manuel, who became King John II of England in 1869, secretly, and he was Queen Victoria's firstborn son. And he was actually the legitimate King of England from um, 1869 to 1910. And he died because his seven and a half year younger, illegitimate, bigamously born half brother, Bertie Prince of Wales, King Edward VII, killed him, regicide. King Edward VII murdered his elder, legitimate half brother, and then semi, semi, very, very dubiously reigned for five weeks only, not ten years, but for five weeks, from um, the 1st of April to the 6th of May, 2000, uh, 1910. Um, and it looks like King Edward VII was regicided himself for regiciding, killing his elder half-brother. So we have a, um, a new king to be acknowledged in England, in the United Kingdom, and that is Prince Marcus Manuel, who was King John II of England. Now, all of this is about purifying the name John. And the kingship is closely related to the Bible and Bible codes and the tradition received and mythology. So, um, by a lot of accounts, King John I was the right bastard. So, a lot of this is about purifying the name King John. And there's a parallel to this, which is purifying the sword of the Duke of Sachsen Coburg and Gotha and purifying the um, British counterpart, which is a usurpation and theft, called the Duke of Saxe Coburg and Gotha. And um, I spent probably about seven years deciphering what happened to the English Duke of Saxe Coburg and Gotha and the German Duke of Saxe Coburg and Gotha. And um, I finally got it right, and that's called purifying the sword. So um, I gave the title, because I've got quite a few titles myself, I gave the title Duke of Saxe Coburg and Gotha to my co-author, Francisco Manuel, and that's called Purifying the Sword. And in return, he gave me the sword of the Duke of Saxon Coburg and Gotha, strangely to sleep with. He gave it to me on um, Leap Day 2012. And he said, keep it in your hand and hold it up to the castle in the morning. So I did, slept with it, and the only person to sleep with the sword of the Duke of Saxon Coburg and Gotha in the morning I held it up to Moorish Castle, which and behind that's Pina Castle. And then within 10 days I'd found the grave of King John II of England. And then King John's are buried in one place for four years and then they're moved to a more salubrious location. And then I found his, um, his second grave uh, in Mont Saint-Michel. And Mont Saint-Michel is where King John II of England's mother, Queen Victoria, was married at the age of 14, and she was pregnant with King John II. She married the second in line to the throne, Blind Prince George of Cumberland. And then seven weeks later, in Carlisle Castle in the very north of England, gave birth to Prince Marcus Manuel, who became King John II of England. Now, when Princess Victoria, uh, when Queen Victoria um, 
uh, made, elevated her firstborn and only legitimate son to King John II of England on the on, on St. Bruno's Day, the 6th of October, 1869, she opened Blackfriars Bridge and the Holborn Viaduct on the same day. So that was a huge mark. And then Queen Victoria was relegated to Victoria Regina, Empress of India. So England had a Shin King, which is um, a forbidden secret, a secret king, which is an esteemed emperor. And that was purifying the name of King John. So, um, when I was finishing the fifth volume, I moved to the Algarve. I moved to the centre of the Algarve, to a place called Carvewera. And I was staying in um, uh, a seafront property. I had it all to myself, three bedrooms, rooftop view to the sea, about 100 metres away. And... Um, I moved in on the 19th of December, 2013. And between Christmas and New Year, a couple of Freemasons, you know, old guys, probably 60, 65, they approached my landlord in the Algarve and said, how's this book coming along? And uh, he said, I, I think it's thing is progressing quite well. He, he's, you know, he's, he thinks he's going to go to print. He's going to print off a copy. There's one volume. Uh, about now, actually. Uh, so they got through to their um, people. Um, probably, probably ugly. Um, United Grand Lodge of England in London. And um, they enacted a law change. And the way they did it is they, and they advertised this as well, on the 31st of December 2013. And they said that 309 old laws have been thrown into a bin to be removed out of the law books, to be revoked. And both the Ministry of, of Justice and the government accidentally threw away the laws that say that if you denounce the royal family or slander the royal family, that you can be sent to the far ends of the earth for your remaining days or killed. And that these laws would be revoked before the 30th of April 2014. And the laws were revoked. And the reason they revoked the laws was that the book was such astounding proof that the current British royal family are flat lie royal, they're fakes, they're illegitimates, they're usurpers, that there was no way that they wanted that case heard. So they had to get rid of the laws. All right? That's amazing, Greg. Right. So, it's just uh, amazing that I, I still can't get over the idea of, of post-dating the laws of secession. Uh, I mean, that seems to me to be a manifest absurdity. Surely the laws apply as long as they're in place and can only be changed contemporaneously. The idea of backdating seems to me such, a, such an obviously devious means for denying the right to challenge the legitimacy of the crown that no one could possibly overlook it once they've been made aware. I know, I know, I'm quite aware of that. But um, uh, there's more to this. It's quite, it's quite intricate. Um, so we've got the laws being changed, and the laws were changed before the 30th of April 2014, which is pretty much the exact date within a month because there were some delays, that I finished the five volumes, from one volume into five volumes, and the rest of the time, from then on, May to early June, was about getting the book, the whole PDF, um, set up to the printer's requirements. And because we've got 
1200 pages and 700 images and we've got such high quality images we needed a really high quality printer so it's pretty much the people who print money in Europe are the same people who printed our books and because there was a lot of money printing going on we actually had to wait quite a few months before we got them and they came from a long way away so that um, the delivery was also another three weeks but the whole thing happened contemporaneously at the same time as though they were changing they were announcing they were going to change the laws and then did change the laws exactly in time with finishing the book and then completing the book ready for the printer right. I imagine that was the game plan uh, that, that they were using your your schedule as their own absolutely absolutely and there, there was a um, there was a plan to make the transition easy and there was only one person obstructing there was that that was a plan that, that actually was the plan in 2012 and all of this was supposed to have been done so easily that you noticed it afterwards and said well how did that happen and then we do a, a TV interview with Bullshit House BBC and all the judges are sitting behind us in support and going well this is how we changed the monarchy and this is why we did it right but um, there, there was something else going on in the background. And part of that was uh, Bible predictions. And part of it was the predictions in the tradition received. And um, part of it was the d detraction was actually that which happens outside the tradition received. Um, now the tradition, the, the Bible records things and it's been translated so many times that uh, kind of works, kind of doesn't, a lot of influence, a lot of mistranslations. Like from the original Bible to the King James Version, there's 14,800 changes. Right. So the tradition received became a more exact means of recording um, what was going to happen. Um, and um, if you look at, well you can't, but if you look at the, um, uh, what's it called? Um, the Despersigny papers, there's only four people in the world allowed to look at the Despersigny papers and, and uh, my co-author was one of them. And they're, um, there are a series of predictions, and sometimes the popes actually uh, add four lines just before they die. So, one of the popes in 1920 was predicting this, and he said, um, Queen Elizabeth II will undo everything that Queen Elizabeth I achieved. She will destroy it. And that's what's happened. Queen Elizabeth I built up England in the 1500s, and Queen Elizabeth II has given England away to strange entities who no one seems to know who they own called the European Union, which is a, appears to be a Catholic Nazi organisation controlling Europe and manipulating currency. A lot of indications that um, Angela Merkel was the artificial insemination daughter of Adolf Hitler. Um, and that's now coming out straight from the um, Russian archives. Um, so uh, let, me get, let me get let me get my head on straight. So um, where are we? Where are we? Um, I'm just trying well, to, you were saying one of the one of the popes had predicted that Elizabeth II would undo everything accomplished by Elizabeth the first. Yeah, and the other thing he said. Um, was uh, the person who achieves this, who actually does this, and who claims this, there is to be no alteration on proportion. Which is very interesting. Because you get uh, a lie, a lie is like a spike, nothing, nothing, a lie, claim, false claim, nothing, nothing, nothing. But if you're actually chosen to do this, you've got backstories all the way 
and everything is supported by everything else and it's kind of even, it's in proportion. Or it could be in proportion like a bell curve, you know? That's actually a scientific mark of the truth, isn't it? If you can discover that the model has a bell curve to it. So yeah. there's, there's to be no alteration on proportion. So the powers of B, which appears to be the top of the secret orders, which appears to be the priori de Sion, which um, means prior knowledge of the sun, and it appears to be above naval intelligence in Paris. Um, what they got back to us was that um, you guys are it, and there's no one else. There's just no one else even close. There's just no one else in the field, you know? So I had purified the sword of the Duke of Sachin, Coburg, and Gotha, and received it, held it up to the castle, found King John II's grave, found where his body was moved to after four years, and given the sword back to um, Francisco Manuel, making him the true Duke of Sachin, Coburg, and Gotha, which is the German legitimate. He was quite happy with that. And I think, you know, he said to me, I, I don't really want to go to England. You know, just don't want to do it. And um, he was dragging his feet. And I ended up, you know, raising all the funding for the books, about £300,000 to research and did all the travel, did 96% of the photographs, all but about six of them. Um, did, laid the whole book up, did most of the research, solved most of the problems in the books, and then solved most of the stories like who Marcos Manuel's father was, etc. And um, the tradition received says that the person who writes the story will be from Lemuria. And Lemuria is um, Australia. New Zealand and the Pacific Islands. That's what it's accepted to be. And um, I'm from New Zealand. Um, and the Bible says that a um, person will come from a, a brother nation. Um, Portugal could be considered a brother nation because they've got their oldest agreement, but England has um, sabotaged that oldest agreement, oldest alliance with Portugal and murdered the Portuguese royal family several times in the 1860s, 1850s, 1860s. And then um, uh, end of the um, 1900s and, and up to 1910 and again in like 1932. So the brother nations of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland uh, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. And Australia was a penal colony, so it leaves Canada and New Zealand. But Canada's not Lemuria, so they left New Zealand. So it was expected that the person who wrote up the story would become, um, would be from Lemuria, and, and that was from New Zealand. And that fits in with that which is outside the tradition received which is basically Prince Philip got hold of the tradition received and then attacked the areas that it indicated. And the areas that it indicated was, according to Queen Victoria's psychics, was the opposite side of the world north, which was the opposite side of the world to where Marcus Manuel lived in Portugal, just west of Lisbon. And that was New Zealand and it was always very close to where I lived. And I lived in places called North, like Lower Northland, North Island, Lower Northland, North Shore, North Harbour, North Cote, North Grove Ave, and Norton Road, which means North Town Road. So I really fitted the bill. So there's been a whole scenario about... Uh, so what, what Prince Philip did is he got his agent, Peter Williams QC, in New Zealand, who was elevated to the uh, president of the Law Society, 
to traffic heroin home to all the places called North. So he was Peter Williams QC. He was Peter Aldridge Williams QC. He's known as PA, PA in mafia circles. Um, he died on the 10th of June 2015, which is one of the best things ever to happen to New Zealand. And at his deathbed was his homosexual lover, Paul Henry. All the mafia bosses are gays and bisexuals and cover marriages and uh, pedophiles and extortionists. So the TV presenter Paul Henry was at Peter Williams' bedside and they were homosexual lovers on the way to protest the Muro Atoll atomic test. And the other person that was at his bedside, bedside was um, Winston Peters, which sounds very much like Peter Williams. It's a very similar name. And Winston Peters was a heroin trafficker with Peter Williams in Tauranga, which is a big harbour, which is where I grew up for about four years. And um, Winston Peters rose to become the Deputy Prime Minister of New Zealand under Rob Muldoon, only 75 to 84, who was also a heroin trafficker. So the Prime Ministers and the, and the heads of the judiciary in New Zealand were heroin traffickers. Right? And they were heroin traffickers looking for me, and they didn't find me, they found people very close to me, like siblings, uh, but they didn't get me. Um, now the, um, the tradition received, or the, actually the, 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 the high orders, like the Priory de Sion, they, they take care of the long year and wait for the results. So you got the, the single year is one year, and the long year is about 2,160 years, and the great year is 12 of those, about 25,600 years, something like that. Um, and w at the end of the long year, which is, it's called end times, and we're in end times now, you know. People look at the Bible and they go, oh, we're in tribulations, you know. And we've got all these, you know, blood moons, etc. The titillation they get, and the Rosicrucians also take care of the long year, the titillation they get out of it is, how does it happen? How does the switch happen? What is it that switches things over to a new royal bloodline or gets rid of a royal family under the protocols of that time at the end of the long year. And the protocols of this time are information wars, not physical wars. We're in the realm of information wars. And the biblical word apocalypse actually means revelation. So what the internet's done is, is it's allowed us to have a revelation where we are not subject to the media control of the BBC, which was founded at the same time as Princess Elizabeth was born, to establish her as a queen by acclamation, when at that time in 1926 to 1952, Three, no one had a say on anything because the media was completely shut down. It was basically just the BBC. It was BBC Radio, and then 1950s and 60s it became BBC TV as well. It was radio newspapers, and then TV was added. So because of all the editors who were constantly getting um, on the... Um, New Year's Honours list and Queen's Birthday list, there was no way that you could actually say the British Royal Family were fake and have it heard. And now you've got the internet, and the internet is a revelation and an apocalypse revelation. And it allows us to expose the fake Royal Family and 
gracefully remove them till the end of their natural days. That's the rules. Um, and, you know, in that respect, Queen Elizabeth II is my charge, and she was given to me on the 7th of October 2011, and then promptly abdicated 21 days later on the 28th of October 2011 at Chogham Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in Perth, in Australia, which is interesting that it was done in Lemuria. Um, and when it came to the um, uh, change to the laws of succession, um, there, were, there were a couple of things that happened that Queen Elizabeth II had to acknowledge. And one of the things she had to acknowledge was that I was now above her, and she had to acknowledge me in some way. So Queen Elizabeth II was given to me on the... 7th of October 2011, and then um, on the 25th of April 2013, I was registered as a member of the Star family, which is the Jesus Mary lineage, in the Holy See. And part of um, going through the eye of a needle is achieving the impossible and getting registered in the Holy See, which is the inner sanctum of the Catholic Church, as a member of the Star family, not being a Catholic. <laughs> because the British royal family can't be Catholics. And Queen Elizabeth II, so-called Queen, has um, married a Catholic and therefore has a null and void reign. And the, um, the coronation stone that she sat on in 1953 was a fake because uh, four Scottish students stole the coronation stone out of Westminster Abbey in London at 4 a.m. on Christmas Day in 1950 and then when they, they they then made a fake stone and put it in Arbroath Abbey in Scotland with a Scottish flag over it and rang up the British and said come and pick it up so they picked up a fake stone which weighed about 122 pounds less than the real stone so they got the fake stone and they stuck it under the coronation chair at Westminster Abbey how, how could they be so taken like that. Greg, I mean, it's fascinating. Why did the Scottish students steal it in the first place? And second, why did the British authorities recognize it was not the authentic stone? Well, that's interesting because um, I've looked at the, the, the students. There's three guys and one girl who stole the stone. And they were Lewishmen. They were the sons and daughters of Freemasons which meant that they were protected pretty much from being charged. Yeah? And that the stonemason they gave it to was a Freemason who looks very much like a steward. And the main thief was Ian Hamilton, the student Ian Hamilton, who then became a lawyer, who then became a Queen's Council lawyer. Right? So if you'd stole, and he's published three books on stealing the stone of destiny or stealing the coronation stone. So if you stole the coronation stone and made Queen Elizabeth II defunct and then even tried to get into law school and then got a degree and then became a Queen's Counsel, that's all impossible. And what I'm suggesting is that they were... Uh, working for the Freemasons and working for the Stuarts. And the Freemasons wanted to put a Stuart back on the throne. And that they were also working for the Rothschilds. Because the Rothschilds recognized that the Shin was due to end in 2012. And that right through the British royal family's history from 1818 to the present, they have been creating 
illegitimate royals so that but covering for them so that when someone like myself <coughs> discovered that they were illegitimate and published it there would actually be very certain facts that showed that they were illegitimate all the way down and that they were so illegitimate it was in your face and unforgivable when it was exposed so that the true royal family could jump in, right? Um, so <coughs> um, I made my co-author Francisco Manuel the true Duke of Sachin, Coburg and Gotha, which automatically makes him the true Duke of Saxe, Coburg and Gotha. So it's a German line and a British line. And the Duke of Saxe, Coburg and Gotha is the second uh, the second tier kingship of England. It's the second born son's title. Um, and it appears that uh, what he did to me uh, was give me the title Prince Pretender to the throne and crown of the United Kingdom. And the only way he could do that was by betrayal. Elaborate on that, Greg. Betraying precisely betraying, who? Betraying me. Betraying me. So yes, this is, this that is, was this my is, inference. But this is why things have um, slowed down so much, um, and there's actually been quite a lot of attacks, if you like, by um, trolls um, and uh, British advertised that it now had. A section of its army working on the internet basically to sabotage the truth coming out and you know I've been quite massively sabotaged in the last 15 months um, but what happened was um, Francisco Manuel uh, we, we got the books and um, we received them early August just a few a few a few sets four or five sets so he gets his set and he goes, thanks, that's great. And uh, then at the end of the, uh, about, about 18 days later, they arrive, arrive in bulk on, on pallets. And uh, then we're supposed to have marketing meetings and we had um, what was agreed to be 15,000 euros set up to do the marketing. And I'd been to see the uh, plane that drives along the beach, flies along the beach with a big banner coming off it to go, as to say, book launch of the Hidden King of England, and it was between um, 200 and 600 euros to have that done, depending on whether I wanted to fly all the way along the Algarve or just halfway along, you know. And um, all the marketing meetings, Francisca cancelled all the marketing meetings, the marketing money went missing, and I was left living penniless in that cave for four months. Um, and uh, <clears throat> I'd been the acting Prince Pretender before with uh, this letter here from Queen Victoria. Is that the right yeah. one? Yeah. Right, that's Queen Victoria's letter addressed to King Don Ferdinand II of Portugal. Um, on the 17th of March 1850, which is St. Patrick's Day, and that letter says, assemble him claim up to the throne. Yeah? Um, now, I was given this letter in its invisible condition when it had no writing on it. Now there's uh, there's uh, Queen Victoria's monogram there. See that? Yes, yes, yes. And there's the hair cut out of the bottom, which means hair to the throne. And there's the, I'm not sure if you can see that, the J. Watman Turkey Mill, uh, Raise it up 1850, J. Watman Turkey oh. Mill, 1850 letterhead. 
Mm. So that shows that it's genuine. And here, uh, you can see it. I might see it better that way, actually. Yeah, there. See that there? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That's um, Queen Victoria's blood thumbprint. <laughs> right? So we have her DNA. And it wow. Appears, yeah. So it appears that... Um, so this, this letter was sent on the 17th of March, 1850, to King Don Ferdinand II of Portugal, who was a Saxe-Coburg Saalfeld Kohari. He was first cousin of Queen Victoria. Yeah. And he was the one that delivered Marcus Manuel from Kensington Palace to Portugal. Yeah. So, um, I had that letter in its invisible, undeciphered condition when I was in England for the clear days from the I, I'm surprised an attempt wasn't made to take it from you. Well, that's because I'm part of the predictions, and I'm actually above the Queen because of my status as a uh, registered member of the Star family. So, um, <clears throat> and that's why Queen Elizabeth II backdated the laws of succession from 2014 to the 25th of April 2013, which is the same day that I was registered as a member of the Star family. And all the that, British and European royals claim to have this descendancy to Jesus and Mary, but then, you know, what they teach to the public is that they died, you know, <laughs> and didn't have any kids. Greg, so, have, you, have, you, have you elicited any legal opinion about the backdating? It seems to me to be an absurdity. No, no, back, backdating is legal. Backdating it, it, it's absolutely legal. All the mafia lawyers use it. All the Prince Philip's agents use it. Um, but um, what happened when I was um, actually? I'll see if I can see if I can just read this. It says here, this is volume three, volume three, page six seventy six, and it says, when Greg Hallett presented this information and thus effectively presented me with the Duchy of Sachsen Coburg and Gotha for Christmas New Year two thousand eleven. I checked amongst the family marks and again found the sword of King Don Ferdinand II and made a scholarly study of it. In return, Greg Hallett's acceptance into the Star family on the summer solstice of 2010 was formalised by the sword of the Duke of Sachsen Coburg and Gotha on the 29th of February and 1st of March 2012. This was part of the purification of the sovereign sword of the Duke of Sachsen Coburg and Gotha. It is the impossible story that has the shin shining all the way through. The shin enacted is a sign of truth in the matter. It is implausible to deceive in light of such a magnificent work. And then, um, uh, so then there's a footnote that, and that um, refers to my elevation to Lord um, Lord Chancellor, Arch Treasurer uh, of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, and um, on the um, uh, in March 2012, and then the footnote behind that, number seven, is letter memorandum, guardian princes of the royal secret, House of Bruno, sent to Jesuit Father Ambrose Bedam, S.J. Cura, Vatican, 25th April 2013. Right, so everything was registered. So the <clears throat> it's a tough game, man. It's a really tough game. Um, so the only way that they, because I, I fulfilled the predictions and I'd done seven eighths of the work, so the only way they could transfer the Prince Pretender status to me, because they said, you know, I said to Francisco, who wrote who wrote the books? You know, who did all the work? Who deciphered all the um, all the codes? And you know, I came up trumps, and so you were, I did, so. They decided to, um, uh, they, you know, he's quite happy with the Duke of Sachsen, Coburg and Gotha. And they're trying to make me the um, uh, uh, Prince Pretender. And I'd been the acting Prince Pretender before, on the 7th of April, 
to the 7th of August 2012 while I was in London with you know, this letter. And um, Prince William acknowledged that by going to New Zealand exactly two years later on the 7th of April 2014 and staying in New Zealand for exactly 21 days, which is the shin. And then Prince Harry acknowledged me by going to New Zealand, specifically to Stewart Island. So you've got the North Island, South Island, and then little tiny Stewart Island down the bottom, which is where my relatives are from. And uh, Prince Harry went there on the 10th of May this year, 2015. It's the first British royal ever to go there. So it's only 370 people there. So there's no real reason for him to go there other than to um, mark things. You know, and he was marking things at the same time as it was no longer illegal to say that the British royal family are illegitimate and fakes and flatline royals and commoners. Um, and it was John Major in 1997 who said Queen Elizabeth II is now just a commoner. And she is. But the whole British judiciary is having a hell of a time getting its head around the fact that it is a headless chicken. And it is just running around, um, unable and without authority to make any judgments. And the, the British judiciary now lacks subject matter jurisdiction. And it lacks subject matter jurisdiction in my case because of the Privy Council um, uh, laws, which are here. Where is it? Um, where is it? Where is it? Um, just trying to find the privy. Greg, Greg, we're we're approaching the point where we need to take a break. Okay. Is this a good point for that? Um, well, I could I could just finish off with the Privy Council oath, please, um, please, because that's a pretty strong thing. So the Privy Council oath is taken by the um, Queen's Council judges, and it's taken by um, both sides of the bench in Parliament. Um, like the Conservatives, etc., and it's taken um, Conservatives and Labour, and it's taken by the Lords in Parliament, and all of that means that they cannot hear anything that is against the monarch or the royal family, and it means that they cannot hear my case, and what they've done is they've used words which. Don't have which have an opposite meaning to the common person's mind and look like a spelling mistake, like the word let. They've used the word let, L E T T, which we would think to mean something like allow, but it means complain of, protest, or condemn. So here's the Privy Council oath, which applies to the judges and lawyers and government, and it protects the Queen. You do swear by Almighty God to be a true and faithful servant unto the Queen's Majesty as one of Her Majesty's Privy Council. You will not know or understand of any manner of thing to be attempted, done or spoken against Her Majesty's person, honour, crown or dignity royal, but you will let, which means condemn, let and withstand the same to the uttermost power of your power, and either cause it to be revealed to Her Majesty herself or to such of her Privy Council as shall advertise Her Majesty of the same. You will in all things to be moved, treated and debated in Council, faithfully and truly declare your mind and opinion according to your heart and conscience, and will keep secret all matters committed and revealed unto you, or that shall be treated of secretly in Council. And if any of the said treaties or councils shall touch any of the councillors, you will not reveal it unto him, but will keep the same until such time as, by the consent of Her Majesty or of the council, publication shall be made thereof. And there's the whole pedophile cover up there. You will to your uttermost bear faith and allegiance unto the, the Queen's Majesty, and will assist and defend all jurisdictions, pre-eminences and authorities, granted to Her Majesty, 
and annexed to the Crown by Acts of Parliament or otherwise against all foreign princes, princes, persons, prelates, states or potentiates. And generally in all things you will do as a faithful and true servant ought to do to Her Majesty, so help you God. Now, if the Mafia had an illegitimate royal family under their guise and wanted to get everyone in government and everyone in the judiciary to swear to their mafia, never to reveal their mafia actions, their heroin trafficking, pedophilia, illegitimacy, bank robberies, fake wars, that is the oath. right? So the Privy Council oath is a mafia oath. The judge's oath is a mafia oath. oath. The government's oath on both sides and the Lord's oath is a mafia oath. So there is no room to get a hearing to say, look, Elizabeth, she's the illegitimate son of, uh, or daughter of um, uh, Elizabeth Bell's Lyons maid and Winston Churchill by artificial insemination, and she was born above a pub, and um, the BBC was created the same time that she was born, the same year, to present to the public that she was a royal. No judge can hear that. And that, that became evident in the judge's decision, basically right at the beginning when I was trying to hear the case, the judge says, uh, we can't hear the case. Greg, this is fascinating stuff. It's going to come as quite a shock to many in our audience. This is Jim Fetzer, your host on The Real Deal, with my special guest, Greg Hallett. We'll be taking a break and return to continue our conversation. Thanks. <laughs>